So I'm uh, kind of a ridiculously big space geek. And um, I brought some astronaut mission patches. They would have worn these on their flight suits or on the variants of their spacesuits. And I'll give this one to anyone who can tell me what we're looking at here. You can take a guess. Pretty close is fine. Anyone? I need an excuse. I can't go back with these, I'm told. But what is it, SpaceX shuttle? That's pretty close. <laughs> okay, what we're looking at here is Elon Musk Crew Dragon. Now, in 2019, this will ferry astronauts to the International Space Station. A few things I want to point out, though. Uh, one is that uh, Crew Dragon, uh, the seats, pull down and kind of slide in front of these panels. And if you've ever been in front of a, an, in a Tesla, they might look familiar to you. These long vertical displays are rather generous amounts of space. But I, what I really want you to pay attention to are the, the displays. You see KPIs, trend lines, uh, bar charts. Essentially, these are displaying key pieces of information uh, for the spacecraft, such as uh, life support, propulsion, guidance, navigation, communication. In short, these are uh, analytical dashboards. Now, what we're looking at here is Orion. This is NASA's next generation lunar and planetary spacecraft. Um, it'll fly sometime in the 2020s. And admittedly, it's not as sexy as the uh, SpaceX Crew Dragon, which was a prototype, by the way, the one we saw. Uh, but if you think about the space shuttle, the shuttle had something like 2,000 switches. And this saw a glass cockpit, according to the astronauts, is a huge improvement. Uh, the astronaut sitting over on the right is looking at the propulsion system. And the astronaut, uh, that center display, is showing you the attitude control of the spacecraft, so how it's oriented. Um, and if you remember the old Apollo capsules, they held about three people. But if you look carefully, you'll see some other feet in there. Uh, this capsule, Orion, can hold about six. And Crew Dragon can hold about seven. Now, this is Soyuz, and this is how uh, American, Russian, it's a Russian capsule, European and Japanese astronauts get to the International Space Station today. A few things I want to point out about Soyuz. Uh, the first are these little joysticks here. Now, American astronauts tell us something interesting, which is that if you think about it, astronauts have a military background. Many of them are test pilots. These are people who are used to being in control, right? Uh, so when they're sitting on, in the Soyuz, which is a mostly automated spacecraft, on top of what ho will hopefully be a controlled explosion, they need something to do with their hands. And so the Russians, in their wisdom, put in these fake joysticks so they uh, <laughs> don't do anything. Uh, so the other thing I want to point out is the little stick here. Now, I don't have a good picture of it. but. The Russian space agency, Roscosmos, tells us that some of my size, about 6'3", uh, could fit in one of these capsules. And that would feel about like sitting sideways in a phone booth. And what's even worse is if I'm wearing a spacesuit, I can't extend my arm fully and actually touch the display panel. So the way I would do that is this L-shaped metal stick. And that's actually how I would hit the switches and touch the two display panels that you see there, which is pretty amazing, right? Uh, the other thing I want to point out is this gentleman sitting here. Uh, his name is Scott Kelly. He's an American astronaut, and he spent nearly a year in space aboard the International Space Station in 2015. Uh, when he returned to Earth, he was two inches taller than his identical twin brother. Uh, and not only that, he, the scientists discovered genetic differences uh, between he and his brother from being in space for a year. It's pretty interesting. So if you think about it, you're a, a spacecraft designer, somebody's designing these instrument displays, it's pretty challenging. You have a very limited amount of screen real estate. Uh, you have to progressively display information succinctly. You're losing connectivity frequently. Your bandwidth is limited uh, and very variable, and you have severe power constraints. So if you think about it, that's not unlike designing an analytical dashboard for mobile. But, uh, okay, so unlike this uh, spacecraft designer, though, you have Tableau, and Tableau has a feature built in called Device Designer. It's gotten even better, and it'll help you make a, get a good shot 
at creating an analytical dashboard. Now, with what we'll teach you today and with what uh, Caroline is going to show you about best design practices, we're going to get you on an excellent trajectory to building analytical dashboards. See the space theme, we've got to keep hitting that. Um, okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Well, three things, basically. We're going to go over what device designer is. We're going to go over what it, uh, how it works. We're really into the fundamentals, and we believe once you understand these basics, you're going to be much more effective at using this feature. And the other one is, coupled with that, we believe that the design principles, that we can arm you with some fundamentals. We don't want to overload you with too much, but those design principles are going to make you just really capable at using this feature. So device designer. So my team uh, developed this feature in 2016. And essentially, it allows you to design a single dashboard that has adaptations that makes it display itself differently on a variety of different screen sizes. And that's essentially it. It's built into Tableau Desktop. So we also get this question frequently, which is why we built the feature. Um, the first answer is pretty obvious, that mobile is too important to relegate to the exec with the fancy tablet. Um, if you're a data-driven company, everybody has a phone. You need to make sure that people are getting access to the, their data no matter where they are. So it's, it's a pretty obvious point, even if your company's not there yet. The other one was that prior to device designer, uh, customers were already publishing mobile dashboards. But what they were doing is they were publishing multiple dashboards, like one for the tablet, one for the phone. Does that, does that ring a bell with anyone here? Yep. So we thought that's an easy one that we can solve. The third reason we built it was more challenging. And this came from our founder, Chris Stolte, who challenged us to do this, which is people love the flowing in Tableau. They love the being able to derive insights and format. And we needed to preserve what you love about Tableau, but we wanted you to be able to create a responsive dashboard. Um, and let me talk about what that means. Uh, responsive, in this case, was referring to responsive web design. Is anybody familiar with responsive web design? A few. So the idea is that you can build a single website that is continually optimizing itself across a wide variety of screen sizes. And it does so while minimizing things like panning, zooming, and scrolling. Uh, it'll even swap out images to make sure they're optimized depending on the type of device you're looking at. So with that, I think what we want to do is cut over and show you a little demo of a responsive dashboard. And then Carolina will come up and show you what devi Device Designer does, and you can compare the experiences. So let me swap here. So this is a dashboard created in JavaScript and HTML. Uh, I want to say I made it myself, but I didn't. I found it on GitHub, and I have a link to it in the PowerPoint deck that you'll get a copy of. But I want you to watch as this. As I go here and take this dashboard and start resizing it, watch what happens. Now, you notice it was kind of optimized for my, my laptop display here. And as I keep reducing the width and reducing the width, I hit this point at which something happens. There. That's called a break point. And at that point, the layout changed, the navigation changed, and some of the elements reoriented themselves so that it's optimized for a tablet display. And now, as I keep going and reducing the width, there we've switched over to a phone display. The phone display actually will lay out the content vertically, so there's a layout change here. So what you're seeing is sort of three canonical views, phone, tablet, and desktop. Now, you can, you can try this if you have your laptops open. You can try this on the tableau.com website or on the Data18 website, and they have a much more elaborate kind of responsive web design experience. So the challenge for the team was to enable you to create something like this but balance that by not changing what you love about Tableau. Um, now, let's gonna, we're going to have Carolina come up here and then demo device designer for you. Thank you, Phil. So the capsule has landed in the Pacific Ocean or has splashed in the Pacific Ocean just off the coast of Long Beach, California, and now we are in wine country to talk about something that I enjoy, which is wine. All right, let's take a look over here at this viz. 
that was created in Tableau Desktop, just as you might have created your own dashboard. Let's see which of these Napa, which of these regions has the most profitable grapes. Well, it looks like it's Napa by a wide margin. Look at that. It's double Lake County, which is right next to it, or even more than double. The reason that they're able to charge so much more for their grapes is because they invest a lot in marketing and because they're actually very sophisticated with their data. Who here drinks wine from Napa? Ah, lots of fans. It's expensive, but it's worth it, right? And I also like drinking wine from Washington, which is a lot cheaper, but also good. Just a <laughs> little plug there. Um, OK, so let's take a look at this button over here, device preview. I'm going to click it. This is how you enter device designer. In this dropdown over here, you can pick the device you want to use to preview your dashboard. Let's start with the tablet. I can also choose over here different screen sizes that I might want to preview, uh, preview this dashboard on. All of these qualify as tablets in our uh, back end. You can also switch the orientation from portrait to landscape. And this here is where you actually commit to adding this layout. Now what happened here is that we automatically sized this dashboard so that it would fit whatever the width or whatever the height of the screen that your end user will be seeing it on. This is really helpful because you don't really know all of the screen sizes that your end users might be on. And this way we guarantee that you won't have scroll bars horizontally or vertically for something that doesn't really need it. So automatic sizing is your friend when you're designing for mobile. Okay, now let's go ahead and this looks, how does this look to you for tablet? Good. Good? It's pretty similar to the desktop form factor, which is why you don't have to do too much, especially if you keep it in landscape. Now let's go ahead and add the phone. Now, did you see what just happened? We are introducing this new feature that you saw on Devs on Stage, which is the automatic phone layouts. It does a lot of good work for you. It stacks the vises vertically so that you don't have to do that manually anymore. However, it is not a silver bullet. There is still a little bit of tweaking that you're going to want to do to make this look just right. So I'm going to go ahead and say, edit this layout myself. The first thing that we can see over there is that the title is being cut off. And the reason for this is that Tableau doesn't yet have scalable fonts. So I'm going to go ahead, and the first thing that I'm going to do is make this text size smaller and stretch this down. And I'm also going to increase the height of my dashboard because notice that this bar chart that has been made in, uh, that is made up of a bunch of little tree maps is really, really tight it would be really difficult for anybody to interact with those. So I'm going to go ahead and increase this to uh, 1,600. It's a bit of a guess, but I don't think I need too, too much more. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. The next thing I'm going to do is uncheck this fix height anchor here. And that right there just gives me a lot more breathing room. OK, so oh, the title is not quite there yet. There. So the text, resizing a couple of zones, and then what, what do you guys think? Good? All right, so I'm going to go ahead and publish this now. Um, and as if we were in a cooking show, this, is, this has been published behind the scenes so that we could avoid any connectivity issues <laughs> in here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and there. Once it's published, here is a trick for you. You can actually use the embedded link and resize your browser window in the same way that Phil was doing, and you can preview your breakpoints. So uh, I'm not going to do that live for you because of our, con our connectivity issues, <laughs> but um, that's th this is the same dashboard. 
All right, I'll hand it back to Phil now. Okay. So how did that work, what we just saw? Well, let's go into that a little bit. The device designer has sort of four key things you need to know about. The first one is that like that responsive dashboard you saw, like it was one website, it's one dashboard that you're designing. The next one is that um, there's sort of a master, we call it the default, that controls all the content. When you use the feature, you build a single dashboard with all your vises and filters and actions and the design, and that's the master template, if you will. The master template also has uh, accompanying device layouts, and that defines how that template or that master is going to appear on a phone layout, a tablet, or a desktop, those three canonical views. But um, before I get into the fourth point, though, we should spend a little more time on that default and those device layouts. It's such a fundamental concept, so once you understand that well, it's going to open up a lot of other possibilities for you in the future. So let's talk about that a little bit. So the first key concept is the parent-child relationship. Oh, by the way, that's uh, me and my identical twin daughters a few years back at the fabulous Seattle Museum of Flight. And we're standing in front of the NASA full fuselage trainer, retired and bequeathed to Seattle in 2012. Um, and astronauts use this, almost every astronaut who flew on the shuttle used this to learn familiarization, familiarization with the cockpit, how to put on a spacesuit in confined quarters, uh, how to cook, and it's made out of plywood. Now, for my birthday this year, I got to take a tour of it, and uh, the most amazing thing, as you'd expect, was the bathroom. Uh, <laughs> what was spectacular about it, or strange, I should say, was that there's an accordion that you pull to close instead of a door, and it was so cumbersome that astronauts never bothered with it. <laughs> and so the routine was on the shuttle, when you went to the bathroom, uh, you just yelled out to your crewmates to kind of stay away because you were in the can. And so, and, and this thing is about, feels like the volume of in, a half an RV, of an RV. That's what it felt like inside this thing. So bathrooms and space. Another design topic. All right. This is a dashboard. Not just any dashboard, but a parent. And like all parents, it has children. Uh, and children, some are short uh, and kind of wide, and others are tall and skinny, and they all kind of look different. Um, not only that, they have the parent's DNA, and so they express that DNA differently. They may look like that, or they may look like that. Um, and so you see where we're going with it. In this case, the parent is the default dashboard, and its children are the device layouts. In this case, the three canonical layouts are the phone, the tablet and, desk, uh, and desktop. Okay, so once we have that concept down, that's pretty fundamental. Um, terminology, at some point though, uh, I wrote the functional spec for this feature and master uh, and clones was, we were obsessing over Star Wars at the time for some reason. Uh, and so this is what was in my spec. No one understood what we were talking about for some reason, uh, so we ditched that. Uh, there was a dark point in which we started on this Blade Runner thing, and thankfully that lasted like maybe four days, but we didn't end up doing that. Anyway, so that's some terminology for you, so I won't slip into the master and clone terminology. Okay, so that's a basic concept. Now, once we understand that basic structure, let's talk about what you can do with it in terms of workflow. By the way, uh, I have another mission patch. Now, this one belongs to Scott Kelly's identical twin, there's a twin theme here, brother, Mark Kelly, he commanded the last space shuttle mission. Um, that was STS-134, Space Shuttle Endeavor. I'll give this patch uh, to anyone who can tell me what this is. Again, a, a guess is probably good enough. What is it, anyone? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so the answer is, it is, uh, it is the year is 1961. NASA just shelled out two million dollars for this thing called LOLA, Lunar Orbiting Landing Approach Simulator. They hired a team of about five artists to paint these large murals of the moon. 
And then they filmed them on closed circuit televisions and rear projected it in front of this airplane cockpit. And the idea was they wanted to take a workflow from uh, aviation that pilots are familiar with and use it to fly approaches as if they were landing on unfamiliar terrain on the moon. So it turns out it was an awful idea. It has nothing to do with how, what it's like to do lunar orbit rendezvous or lunar descent. Totally worthless. Uh, and they scrapped this thing in about 1967. Hardly ever got used. But it's an example of workflow. Um, and for you aviation geeks, the yoke and pedal assembly there is from a DC-3, an old you know, classic propeller plane. OK. So we've got the default dashboard. What do you need to know about it? Most important thing, this is where you start. I may keep reemphasizing that point. Build your, here, build a dashboard here. Once you've done that, then go and make the phone layout. Start with the phone because it's the hardest. It has the most constraints. You may not be able to use all your visas on the phone, so start there. Once you've created the phone, tablet and desktop are next. They're much easier, and they'll be a lot more similar to the default. So that's the workflow that my team recommends. So content control, the very basics of how you control content and workflow is this. Uh, when you have the default dashboard, if you want to control the content in the device layout, just delete a viz. And if you delete a viz, it gets deleted from all of the child device layouts. Similarly, there's some other behaviors. If you format a viz, it formats all the child device layouts. Um, if you resize a viz, for example, or resize, change the sizing behavior of the viz in the default, it'll change the sizing behavior in all the corresponding uh, child uh, device layouts. Similarly, if you use something like uses filter or deploy an action in the default, it'll apply it to all of the child device layouts. So you get where this is going. These are the basic concepts here. Probably the most important ones that I think people run into is like formatting is controlled by the default. The sizing and resize behaviors like entire view and fitting is controlled by default. So those are important things to keep in mind. It's really fundamental to this feature. Oh, you know, we'll leave, uh, we'll leave time at the end for questions. OK, so again, the key concept is create the default first. Uh, all right. So you might be thinking at this point, well, what good is this feature? I mean, if you've got this default and then the child layouts just do whatever, those are like children who are excessively obedient, right? And so what's the point of that? So the, the reason you would use this feature, well, we'll get into that in a minute. There's a little more to it. Oh, by the way, does anybody know who Ron Popeil is? I got a few people here who know. It's like, uh, so in like the 80s and 90s, there's a company called Ronco, and Ron Popeil was the spokesman for this company that had a rather, maybe you'd say, dubious set of products uh, they promoted on television at night. Probably the most infamous was this one, spray-on hair, <laughs> which unfortunately didn't work. All right. OK, so let's talk about customization. Oh, another little space aside. That guy's named Ron Akaba, American astronaut, landed in Kazakhstan in 2015. And occasionally, it's customary to sign the charred exterior of a Soyuz capsule. That capsule hit the atmosphere at about 17,500 miles an hour. There's a plasma sheath that formed around it, and the temperature is about 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's uh, hotter, twice as hot as the molten lava. Um, and the little thing in the upper left is a recovery beacon, because they land in cold in Kazakhstan often, and they need helicopters to swarm in and rescue the astronauts pretty quickly. OK, so here's our familiar layout. Um, and so what can we do in terms of customization? Well, if you've defined all three device layouts, the very first thing you can do, and the most obvious one, is you can delete, say, a tablet layout or one of the layouts. Now, if you do that, uh, something happens. Like any good helicopter parent, default drops in and takes over for its child. And so what happens is anybody viewing this dashboard on a tablet will actually see the default layout rather than the specific tablet layout that you've made. And it'll do that for any device layout. Default takes over. So deleting is part of the workflow, if you wanted to do that. Now, we don't necessarily think that's such a great idea on the team. Uh, what we think is a better idea is to define all three layouts. One reason is, if you're like in a BYOD environment, then everybody know what that means? You know, bring your own device. Uh, in that sort of environment, you want to make sure that uh, you're accounting for all the possible sizes of screens. It turns out that desktop, tablet, and phone, it, 
as far as Tableau Server is concerned, is the entire universe of all possible devices. And so if you define all three, default never gets displayed. No one ever sees it. And that actually opens up some interesting possibilities that Carolina will get into, something called staging area, and it allows you to customize the phone in ways that you can't normally. You can have different visits, say, on a phone or on a tablet. Um, but the, the kind of pro tip from our, our dev team is this. Uh, always define all three, especially if you're getting started. In the beginning, we had a lot of really advanced users saying, just make the phone, but that's not a good idea. You want to have control and you want to create all three, even if it's a minimal amount of effort. So how does this work? Well, uh, when you go to the layout and you've created all three, you'll see a button, the lower circle, and it'll let you toggle between default and custom. And so that would be like this, and you would toggle that. And so there, what I'm doing is I'm severing the connection, in this case, for the phone layout. And so the phone layout uh, now is kind of like a teenager, if you will, somewhat more independent from the parent, but still the parent has a role. Uh, and so let's see what happens in this case. Well, if you do sever the connection by hitting custom, here's, here's what you can do. One thing for starters, you can remove visits, and that's the most obvious customization. Uh, the other one you can do is you can do resizing, you can reposition, um, you can add a dashboard object like a text object, and you can format it. Uh, you can do other things such as, and this one's really powerful, you can, you can show and hide quick filters and you can change their type because you might need a different type of quick filter on the phone. You almost always want something different than on desktop. Um, and then you can do other things like uh, change the sizing behavior so you can, like you saw Carolina do, is increase the height of the dashboard, for example. So customization, what is it all about? To recap, it's about all these things. Um, again, the thing I think is really important is the quick filters. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would say that's probably where you're going to get a lot of utilities optimizing those quick filters for the phone layout. Now, there's more, like uh, Ron Popeil might say, but wait, there's more. Uh, customization. So you saw this feature on Devs on Stage, but actually some of that automatic mobile layout was released in 18.2. Uh, and what it does is actually this. This is what it's actually doing. Um, if you were to go and click Preview and click Add Phone Layout, it actually will add, uh, automatically stack up all your visas vertically. And it does something, it has an algorithm which is pretty simple, but very effective. What it's doing is it's putting the quick filters above the viz, the legend below, and it repeats that on a nice long stack. Now, I love this feature. It just, when you're building a phone layout, it's just an amazing way to get started. Uh, but, you know, we wanna be very transparent and practical with you. It's not a magic bullet. It's not gonna just create a perfect phone layout. You've gotta do some tweaking. You saw Carolina do it, looking at fonts are gonna be something you wanna pay attention to, and you wanna be selective about the visits. Some visits just don't work on a phone and you may wanna get rid of them. And Carolina will get into some of this with you. So here I'll return to this default dashboard again. Um, you, uh, Get, can't get away from the fact that it's still default. It's in control of things like formatting and actions and the viz sizing. Um, so in that sense, you know, it never stops being apparent. So you, when you're designing, you always have to balance the constraints of this default master that you've created. And you always have to keep that in mind. And I think that's probably the kind of tension in the beginning when you're learning how to use this feature that you'll run into is that you need to put things into the default first. Uh, by the way, that plane is the shuttle carrier aircraft. And back in the early 70s, it was an oil crisis. Uh, and during that oil crisis, American Airlines needed to unload some planes. NASA engineers had built this our radio control model for this thing. People thought it was ridiculous, but they were allowed to build it, uh, and then eventually acquired this as a mechanism for transporting the shuttle. And it could ferry the shuttle about 1,100 miles. Uh, and carried maybe about 170,000 pounds. Uh, and so if you're into elephants, that's like, 118 South Asian elephants or 58 African elephants? You know, put it in perspective for you. Uh, okay, so four things. There's one dashboard, one. There's a default, a master. There are device layouts. What's the fourth? Well, the fourth is this, and I run into this all the time. You saw that device selector that Carolina showed you? You're not designing for this. This is an iPhone 7 and you're not designing for this. Even though you select it, you're not creating it specifically for this. And that is probably the most common mistake that people make with this feature and with responsive uh, web design. 
So what actually is happening in this case? Well, back in 2015 when we started designing this feature, the Open Signal site uh, was logging all the different mobile devices that were accessing their website across a year. By the end of the year, they recorded about 12,000 different unique Android models accessing their website. They report that today that number is closer to 45,000. In the industry, this is known as device fragmentation, meaning it's just like a proliferation for a particular operating system of variants of the device. The, uh, the, now, the visual over on the right shows you uh, a graphic from 2013, and it shows you that even back then there was this cr uh, kind of crazy continuum from small phones to phablets all the way to tablets. Um, so what this all means is that if you're a software engineer and you're building a feature like this, we have to be a bit wary of the detection logic relying on the phone to reliably say, I am this kind of phone, this is my resolution, and this is the screen size, number of physical pixels. So we knew we couldn't trust it, so we had to rely on something else. And so what was the answer? Well, for us, as in all things, the answer lies in space. Okay, maybe not. So it's embeddable space. Uh, Embeddable space, so what is embeddable space? Okay, so this is a phone, and the phone, uh, you can orient it like this, or you can orient it like that. And when you do, there's a space allocated to the dashboard, and there's a little toolbar that's part of that dashboard. Now the space that the phone allocates for itself, you know, the part where you see your battery levels and the navigation, but the space that is free to the dashboard to, dis to be displayed, that is the embeddable space. And now Tableau Server is very interested in that. And when we're loading the dashboard, it's doing a computation to figure out the amount of available embeddable space. So this turns out to be, like responsive websites, a better way uh, to figure out what device layout to serve up than using only the device model. And one reason is because you could do something like this. You could embed uh, your dashboard onto a blog, say, and then use the detection logic from Tableau Server to figure out what the most optimal type of uh, dashboard to display. So it's not tied only to devices. We wanted to call the feature the uh, embeddable space designer, but marketing shot that down. It was a brilliant idea. I don't, but uh, OK, so embeddable space. So what is it doing? Um, well, this gets a little esoteric. But here, this is very important, because if you're going to run into problems with this feature, it'll happen here. Uh, and this is where I talk to a lot of customers, and this is where it happens. So what it's doing is Tableau Server is computing the height and width of the embeddable space. And it says, I'm going to remember the smallest dimension, which in this case is the width. If you had loaded the viz with the phone oriented sideways, like that, the smallest dimension would be the height. Um, and Tableau Server says, OK, I'm going to take this small dimension that I just calculated, and I'm going to save it. And then I'm going to do this. I have a lookup table and have some rules. And the rule is, if that small dimension is 800 pixels or more, then that is going to mean I'm going to serve up the desktop layout. Between 800 and 500, you get the tablet. 500 or less is the phone. And that's it. That's really all there is to it. But we kept it simple in the beginning because to make the detection logic more complex than it could have been, we would have offloaded that onto you as the author. You would have had to make some determinations and rules, and we were, had to think about adding too much complexity to the product. But what it does mean is this, though. So if you have this continuum of devices from desktops to tablets to phablets to small phones, we have to make a decision and chunk that into three. And that means these devices have to be kind of grouped into three. And what that means is you're going to get some devices, and I can think of one right off the top of my head, which is the... MacBook 13-inch, which is in that fuzzy realm between the tablet and the desktop. And sometimes the detection logic will decide that that is a tablet instead of a phone. Now, there are ways around that, but it's something you should know. Now, I provide some more details in the appendix about this. There's a lot more to this detection logic and things you should know for like troubleshooting. Because really, designing for mobile uh, and creating these responsive experiences, sometimes these devices on the edges will need, require some of that additional thought. However, you can, you can save yourselves a lot of effort with our beautiful Tableau mobile app. Uh, 
Uh, you saw, if you saw devs on stage, there are some new features coming to it. It's really elegant. It's beautiful. But the great thing for device designer is that it says, hey, don't do any of that detection logic calculation. I'm a phone. Always give me the phone layout. Same with the tablet. So it bypasses any uncertainty. Uh, not to mention it has like uh, interactive offline snapshots, mobile device management integration, favoriting, single sign-on. Uh, it has some other workflow features that are really nice. So if, if your organization will allow you to do that, I would highly recommend using this. So um, with that, those are some basics of how Device Designer works. It's not everything. It's more information in the appendix. But now, Carolina is going to come up and give you the other essential piece, which is how do you design for mobile? So I'll hand it off to her. Thank you, Phil. All right. What we're going to look at here are a couple of things. First, we're going to see how mobile is different from desktop. We're going to talk about best practices when designing for mobile, and then how to get the most from, in mobile from Tableau specifically. Can anybody tell me what you think is going on in this image? Maybe they're playing games, yeah, potentially. Yeah, they're commuting, they're on, their, on the subway. Lots of people play games or do things like that. They're, they also could be working, right? They could be working on, and people in Asia can spend up to two hours each way commuting, which is a lot of time. So can you tell me what you think is unique about their situation in this case? Yes, exactly. They may have no network. They may be offline. What were you saying? Not time. Oh, yeah, they're not wasting time for sure. Um, but yeah, they may not, they're not going to have connectivity as well. What about here? They don't have a laptop. These could be just some friends having coffee, or who knows, they could be coming up with the next multi million dollar startup. They have a bunch of screens in front of them. They don't just have one. They have the tablet. They have the phone. 61.46% of internet use today comes from these mobile devices. And that number is only going up around the world. And in this picture over here, this woman over is actually working at her desktop, but there's a phone right next to her. How do you use your phone when you're at work? You have some message that you're waiting for, some critical notifications. You're kind of multitasking. And the role of that device is different depending on the context as well. So what are some things, oops, some things that we saw? We saw that there may be no connectivity. We saw small devices. We saw small screens. And it's going to be hard for your end user to touch that screen uh, if you have very small targets. They don't have a delicate cursor. They have their fat fingers. And the last thing to keep in mind is that they are on the go. They will most of the times have less time. They'll have a smaller attention span. It's more like of a snack mindset as opposed to a full meal. Uh, so they need the highlights. They need the takeaways. So you're probably busy and you're wondering what happens if you do nothing to create the mobile dashboard. Well, maybe auto-generated layouts does a great job for you and you're, you're, you're good to go. But not doing anything can have some unintended, unintended consequences. Like in this case, this is an overgrown grapevine. The leaves have just taken all the energy away from the grapes, and now there's no, no way for the grapes to grow. So how can we counter that? Uh, so here we are again with our but Wine dashboard on desktop. Once you publish it to your desktop, it'll ob obviously look uh, pretty good. Now, if you didn't do anything on the tablet or on the phone in the current Tableau, this is what would happen. Um, in this case, the iPad Pro actually has higher resolution than the desktop. 
So notice that the use of screen, it's, it, it's, it's, it's okay, but there's some white space there at the bottom and we're not making the best use of the space. Not that I don't like white space, I love white space, but we wanna use it where we want it. Um, and then on the phone, if you did nothing, it would be really, really hard to read, really, really hard to touch. So with Autogen, it would look like this. So again, like I mentioned, the text, something to, to be aware of, and the vises themselves at, in some cases. So decanting wine is a good tip that I can give you. I'm not, I'm not a sommelier by any means, but I know that decanting wine is a nice way to leave the sediment behind, and it aerates your wine, it makes the young wines taste better as well. So let's talk about technique. The first thing on the phone layout is that we've stacked these vises for you vertically, but if you have a really complex dashboard with a whole bunch of vises, you're probably gonna have to do some pruning because we don't wanna have more than two to four main views on the phone. What happens by the time you scroll all the way to the bottom is that your, your end user is probably gonna forget what they saw at the top. And with visualization, it's good to have a sense of the, the entirety of your data. Um, you could do drill-ins and, and that sort of thing, but you don't want them to forget what they saw at the top. The second thing, obviously, is put the most important information at the top. If they're snacking and they're just gonna come in and out, you want that big highlight to be there. Filters. So Phil touched a little bit on this. This dashboard over here has a whole bunch of filters. Now imagine what it's like to interact with that. Like, hmm, like tweak this, you know, like it's kind of cumbersome. So our tip for you is don't do more than two to three filters on mobile. Um, this is a good template for you. So if you have your title, you'll have your title at the top. If you have some big numbers, uh, for, for takeaways, KPIs type of thing, and then two to three filters, and then your visits that come stacked underneath. The next thing you wanna do is make sure that you fit each view on a screen, because if your map is going beyond the boundary of your screen, that, again, that hinders your end user's ability to really understand the, the entirety of the data. So that scatter plot, I can see it. And that bar chart, I can also see it within um, one screen height. I don't know if you've used this feature before, but we have Vizen Tooltips, which we released in 2018.1. And we give you a default uh, width for your tooltip with Vizen Tooltips, which is 300 pixels. My recommendation to you is to not change that because if you make it any wider, what's gonna happen is we're going to resize that down for you on the phone, and it's gonna run into the same problem that that desktop dashboard had. It's gonna get like really teeny tiny. So make it, do it in a way that it works at that 300 pixel wide. Um, touch interaction, so we talked a little bit about the fat fingers. So the thing here is, it's gonna be difficult for you to control the size of the marks, right? Because you have data and data changes and you can't predict all the different ways in which it might change. But just keep in mind, this is the rule of thumb. Preferably a touch target is 45 pixels um, in area. That's a lot, right? 18 pixels is the minimum. That's like where the user can actually understand what they are clicking on. Um, you're not gonna be able to control all of that, but it's something to keep in mind because there are a few things that you can do. You could actually, for example, go into your sheet and increase the size of your marks. That's one thing you could do. The other thing that you can do is you can increase the space between the rows in a bar chart, for example, making them easier to touch. So in this case, I've made it so that I have about 30 pixels distance between the targets of each um, bar. Uh, okay. 
The next thing to keep in mind is that typography is tricky. <laughs> and uh, you want to be cross-platform. Does anybody here know what a WebSafe font is? Yes, do you want to share? <laughs> That's right. So they're available on all browsers, all devices. And if you stick with these, you will run into less problems. Now, please don't use Comic Sans or Impact or Courier because these are not very legible at small sizes and they're not going to look very professional. But they are web safe, just that's why they're listed there. Um, the other thing you could use is our beautiful Tableau font, which is clean, it sizes well, it's, it's a great font to go to. Always an exception to the rule. Roboto will be uh, the default font on Android. Everything gets replaced with Roboto, so just know that. <laughs> um, okay. The gesture model that we have on Tableau tries to allow you to do a whole bunch of different things. So be aware that if you have a lot of scrolling sheets in your dashboard and your end user is scrolling vertically, that may introduce like unintended scrolling. So minimize the number of scrolling sheets within your scrolling dashboard if you can. The, oh, this contrast is really low. We can't really see the map. That's New Orleans, okay? There's a map of New Orleans right there. <laughs> In maps, you can pan or you can zoom. So there's yet a little bit more complexity to those gestures. And our recommendation for you to uh, re reduce the competing touch targets there is that there's two things you can do. One is that you can actually put the map at the bottom of your dashboard so that by the time they get there and they're panning around, they're not trying to scroll anymore to the bottom of the dashboard. The other thing that you can do, which I did because you know my, uh, my map was actually at the top. What I did was I turned off a, a pan and zoom so there is no question what's going to happen there. If my user scrolls, they're just going to scroll on the dashboard. OK, some things we talked about. Give some special love and attention to the phone layout. Um, the touch interaction is important to keep in mind. Fat fingers. Be cross-platform and legible. Also keep in mind that 12 points is the good rule of thumb for the small text on the phone. You don't want to go much smaller than that. And optimize for our gesture model. And you'll be able to take this with you as well. This, this PowerPoint will be available for you to download. This image over here is my version of something that looks very tech very uh, fancy and space-like. Um, it's the fermentation dome at Palmas Vineyards in Napa. It's lined with 24 fermentation tanks. And the projections on the wall are all uh, giving insight into the fermentation process, which is, I just thought I should throw that in there because, you know, we can also look very space-like with wine. <laughs> OK, I'm going to quickly walk you through some things in Device Designer. Uh, the first thing that we do for you is we fit your dashboard to the width of the screen, uh, which is automatic sizing. As I mentioned before, this is your friend. This is your friend for phones. This is your friend for tablets. Phil mentioned before, you want to define the three layouts for desktop, tablet, and phone. Staging area is something that I kind of glossed over, but I'm going to crack that open for you right now. If you have a viz that you think is going to be just really hard for somebody to interact with, there's a lot of dense marks, you have just too much detail, you may want to create actually a second version of that. In this case over here, for example, let's say I thought that scatter plot had just too much, too much, and I'm simplifying that viz for the phone. Maybe I made it into a pie, pie chart or something. So I have two versions of that in my default dashboard. 
And I, that gives me the flexibility to put that scatter plot on the desktop and on the tablet and apply the pie chart on the, on the phone. And because I've defined those three layouts, my end user, my end user is never going to see those two vises on the default, unless they open your workbook, in which case they will. So, um, for example, let's get back to the California Wine Production Dashboard. One thing that I did uh, for that you may have noticed or you may not have noticed when I was showing this with the touch uh, targets is that I converted that viz, which is a bar chart with tree maps on the desktop and tablet, into a simple bar chart. I removed the, gri the grape varietal information from that and just kept the region uh, productivity. I was like, well, you know, maybe people aren't going to be digging into that information so much. It's good to talk to your end users and see what it is that they really need to know so that you give them the right information. They're not re reducing to a point where it doesn't make, you know, that it doesn't add value to them. Uh, the other thing that I did is I actually uh, flipped the orientation of the precipitation history viz and made it vertical in the version that I published at the end of at the end of the day. Um, so, on the left, the version with just a simple resize, and on the right, the version with the, with the yeah. uh, custom vises. Tableau gives you only one orientation per device layout. So you have to choose wisely. We cover the 80% case, but if you feel like for any reason in your case, the dashboard would be better seen as landscape on the phone, you can go ahead and change that. Um, we don't yet offer two orientations per device layout. We're, we're working on that. Um, the other thing that you want to keep in mind is because your end users might have limited connectivity, because there's different load times, all those types of things, you want to optimize performance. And one thing that you can do for that is minimize the amount of marks. Like I said, if you have a lot of density of marks, if you can cut, you know, Customize that, that's helpful. Uh, and then less sheets. Don't publish, just mindlessly publish everything in your workbook because that's gonna take a hit on performance as well. Speaking of sheets, sheets by default, sheets do not appear as tabs on uh, the mobile app. So make sure that you're setting up your permissions in a way that allows people to navigate without requiring the sheets as tabs. The reason that we made this decision is because it actually is really difficult for people to read those little, uh, the text on those little tabs, and it's difficult for them to touch them. And even if they, it was easier to touch them, if you had 10 sheets and they were all going across, you know, people wouldn't see everything. It's better for them to see it in a list. So that's why we made that decision. Last but not least, test. Make sure that you're testing on real devices and not just relying on that device designer layout preview because there's always a little bit of difference. So test on the tablet, test on the phone. And one thing that we didn't, we weren't, we, we didn't show you here in the demo, we have a new feature coming out in 2019.1, uh, which is this ability to actually preview those device layouts once you've published them without having to resize the window. You can still do that, obviously, but uh, you don't have to do that. You can just click on device layouts and preview those. Very cool, exciting new features you saw devs on stage present today. I'm going to say don't use those for the phone, unfortunately, for now, because uh, transparent zones rely on floating zones, and floating zones um, will not be good for your phone layout because of the automatic sizing. And the show hide container at the moment won't do the thing that you want it to do on the phone. Again, coming things we're working on. Um, so that's what happens with the uh, automatically generated phone layout uh, with the transparent zone. I mean, that's, that's not the main problem. The main problem is the, the fact that you can't, you won't want to float. Uh, the other thing is the image size. If you keep the image 
on the phone really big, you're gonna be taking up just precious slow time for something that you don't need. You could, if you really wanna put an image in there, you wanna resize, create a, a separate um, version of it in a smaller size. That's something you could do, but again, relying on floating zones. Um, okay, and just uh, back to our tips, fit width, define the breakpoints, use default as a staging area, Keep in mind you only have one orientation per device layout, optimize performance, no sheets as tabs, and test. All right, time for questions. <sighs> Wait, thank you. <sighs> Any questions? For the moment, in, uh, in Tableau Mobile, yes, it, we, we do that for you by default. You can't change it. Did, I, did well, you say yes or no? Sorry, yeah, sorry. do you want to repeat the question, Caroline? What? Can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. So he asked me if there's any way to control the way those sheets as tabs appear on the phone. And I said no, not for the mobile app. Um, on the web, they will show up as, as tabs. If you open it on mobile web, it'll show up with sheets as tabs if you publish it that way. Um, I don't recommend it for the web either. Is, can you tell me a little bit more why you? Yeah, because on, on, the, on the iPad app, uh -huh. it, it appears as sheets. And oh, yeah. It used to be phone, and then they expect the same experience on the mobile app on the iPad. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Because it's more inclined on the pixel thing to then stop. That's yes. To show the icon of the sheet. Um, we do have the icon on the app it's in the, the tablet. On, on Not in the not in the new app, okay. not in the new app. I'm I'm pretty sure. But uh, if you give me your card, I'll get back to you on if there's any difference. Um, yeah, did you, yeah. yeah. Question. Uh, Yeah, I think it just depends on um, how you have that container set, whether it's fixed width or not. It should be just a matter of, um, you know, with Device Designer, you can actually delete the layout and use a different container to display the sheets because the most basic elements are the vises themselves. So you don't have to use what works on the, on the desktop or default dashboard. You can actually switch to a vertical container and that'll work fine as long as you turn off the fixed height setting. It should be just fine. So I can use different containers for the mobile. Yeah, I would I'd totally encourage that. You're just going to get a better design. The only limit, the only thing you need to use is the content defined in a default dashboard. Mm -hmm. Question back there? I don't know who is next. Yeah, no, you do not have to have a separate version. You have it all in that one file. That one dashboard, you customize the three layouts, it's one file. Yeah. 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 So the question was, all do you need separate Twibix files for each device layout? If you were to open up the XML, you would actually see these nodes in the XML for each device layout. So all one file. Question back, back there. Yeah. Mm. Yes, uh, so generally the guidance on performance is that when you have automatic sizing, 
uh, versus a fixed size dashboard, Tableau Server can't use its caching as effectively. So imagine all of us in this room had the same exact size phone. I'm Tableau Server, once I've served up the dashboard to you, if you were the first person to request it, then I could cache that and we could all get that together. Now when everything's automatic size, if we had all these wildly different devices, Tableau Server has to work harder and say, well, I have to recompute that layout, recompute that layout, and send it out. So in general, range sizing or automatic sizing, you're gonna have a performance impact. There are other factors, such as the number of connections in your workbook, a lot, the number of sheets in the workbook, uh, those really affect load time. But automatic sizing usually, this is a downside to mobile. There are some other talks here that I've put up that get into this a little more, but there's a downside to using range or to using automatic sizing, which is what we rec recommend for uh, device designer. Yes, because uh, range is using automatic sizing between a range. So if you're not familiar with range, range just says between this size and this size automatically fit the dashboard in between those two size extremes. And automatic just fits any size. Uh, so yeah, there, there's a performance impact for using automatic sizing or range sizing because of that inability to use the caching, server caching. Um, Yeah, yes. Uh, we now, I'll give you a hint. It's something Caroline and I are working on in Seattle, which is a way to fix that for a future version of Tableau. Are but you no. Are you oh, I won't get into that too much because it's something. This is what. Our, What's that? Our, but, layering in containers. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. hopefully next year we'll do a whole talk about something that's coming, but the new layout for, to, to your question about floating, uh, floating doesn't work well with the automatic sizing because everything will scale, and it's as, as if the vises are glued to a rubber sheet and it's being stretched, and that isn't really what you want on a phone. So mm -hmm. we definitely recommend tiled with automatic to keep it really simple. So do you get more than one URL for the different uh, devices? No, it's a single URL. It's all the detection logic. Um, yeah, the detection logic takes care of that. However, do you need to refresh so that, it, so that Tableau Server can recompute the layout? But yeah, it's just one URL. That's the big benefit of it. You had a question. Any questions too. on this side? Um, yeah, it was just the, the design thing. I didn't know if you had any tips for um, thinking like white space and padding. Do you uh -huh. have any hard and fast? I do this on desktop, but I want to make sure I increase above, below, left, or right in a mobile. There isn't a, like a, it's hard and fast. It sort of depends on your content. Okay. Um, it's good to have a little bit of white space, but on the phone you don't have a lot of room for a lot of white space. So um, you, a little bit. <laughs> it depends on, it really depends on what you have on there. Okay. Um, mm. Yeah. Consistency is key though, especially if you have people going between different dashboards, you wanna maintain that spacing consistent across, because otherwise things jump around. Yep. So whatever you do, make it consistent. Thank you. Yeah. So I have a question about multiple size dashboards in the same workbook. Let's say I'm not designing with a uh, device designer, mm. but I know it's got big uh, on a dashboard, mm -hmm. huge, and then little documentation page. Mm -hmm. I've noticed for years, server says, like, here's my workbook, James mm -hmm. has this big page, I'm gonna need all that space anyway. Mm -hmm. Any tab I look at, it's that size. Even if the documentation page now will have a bunch of mm -hmm. white space. Mm -hmm. Now, from what you guys have shown me, I wonder if I should have gone ahead and defined the layout with, if I had, instead of skipping device designer altogether, if I had defined desktop layouts for my documentation page and my main dashboard, would server be able to render those two things Right, that's a Tableau issue. It's not even specific to mobile, which is, in general, you, um, if you have a dashboard in your workbook that's ginormous, what it does is when server's doing the calculation, it says, oh, I'm setting aside this amount of space for the largest one. Yeah. And that can affect uh, what gets displayed uh, on Tableau server. So as a design measure, you wanna kind of pick everything to be the same size. And it's, it's not so much the height, it's the width. 
because yeah. the especially when you have sheets as tabs, the we're we're sizing it to the widest one so that the yes. yeah. And the thing of it is, I can put everything up, but now I've got copies of my data. Right. So kind of a, yeah. okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, we have maybe one last question, um, and we'll hang out a little bit yeah. afterwards. You can. So we got yeah. one question over here inside. Question. Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, remember I said we can't rely on the detection logic to tell us information. Mm -hmm. Normally, you can ask the phone and say, "What are you? Uh, what size physical screen? And what is your device pixel ratio?" Um, and that actually tells you the the actual multiplier for the pixel density on the phone. We don't know anything about that. So, when in the des in device designer, all we know is the physical size of the screen. So we design for the lowest common denominator, assuming that you don't have a lot of real estate. But when you do get on a high resolution display, like some kind of Galaxy 9, there's a pixel ra ratio as a multiplier that you multiply the resolution, and you may have a lot of room. And if with automatic sizing, it'll just fill in and look nicely. But this gets to Carolina's point where you have to test it, especially because mm -hmm. we don't have a way to do that. Now, mm -hmm. she didn't get a chance to show you this. It's in the appendix. There's a tool that Google has in Google Chrome we can put in the device pixel ratio and simulate that. Mm -hmm. um, th the truth is, we try to make this simple, but we don't want to turn you into developers. Uh, we need you to use Tableau the way you're familiar, but we do gloss over some things. Uh, not gloss over them, but we abstract them, make them simpler than they are. But these issues just mean that uh, if, without making the tool too technical, you need to do some testing to make mm -hmm. sure that you are aware mm -hmm. of that. But the device pixel ratio is a great one, because some people may have a lot more resolution than is apparent from what device designer mm -hmm. is saying. That said, if you have an iPad Pro and you're using the Tableau mobile app, it will render as a tablet. And if you have the, you know, whatever super high density phone, but you're using the mobile app, it will always know it's a phone. So that's another way to get around it. Well, we can take a question afterwards, but, but. Uh, Can you pull extensions work in it? Yeah, extensions are any kind of dashboard object. The only trick with extension is you're hosting another web page in there. So you have to think about what the usability of that web page is. And then the phone may have its own problems with it, like the device and the browser rendering. And so you have to really test it. That gets a little tricky. But in theory, to us, it's just any other dashboard uh, zone is what we call it. Mm -hmm. Hey, well, we'll stick around. Thanks so much. Uh, it was wonderful talking to you all. Uh, thank you. Maybe you can take a second to rate it in the app. That would be helpful, too.